What's a HIPAA release and why does a caregiver need one or why does a recipient of care need one? Well, here to talk with me about that is Harry Margolis, who is author of Get Your Ducks in a Row. Harry, welcome. It's always good to be back with you, Bob. Pleasure. Such a pleasure. Uh, so we're here today. This is uh, part of our continuing series looking at legal and financial documents that the caregivers and recipients of care need. Uh, right now, we want to focus on the HIPAA release. Uh, what is it and who needs it and why do we need it? Well, so it's a very important document. So, of course, HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Exactly. Thank you very much. So, it's a it's a great law. It protects your your data basically, so that uh, people aren't. It protects your privacy, and from, from that point of view, protects your autonomy. So, medical personnel are not supposed to be talking about your private matters um, without authorization from you. And uh, and in most cases, that's a great thing. But in some cases, uh, it can get in the way. So, um, because you, in most cases, would want your your family members, if you're unable to communicate yourself, would want your family members or other trusted people to communicate for you. And um, and there's sort of two sides to this. There's the um, providing of information, and there's the receiving of information. And sometimes these get mixed up. So. Um, so what the what HIPAA bars is the healthcare personnel or institutions sharing information with other people, um, and they, but it doesn't bar them receiving information. Uh, so the um, so talking about uh, their sharing information, if uh, you are ill or you're hospitalized, you probably want um, that information to be shared with your loved ones or with particular ones. Um, and especially with your health care agent. Now, the, um, most state laws say that if you name a health care agent under your health care proxy or, or power of attorney, they, th that in effect is a HIPAA release, meaning that the medical people can, can talk to them. But we always include a separate clause in our documents that explicitly grant a HIPAA release for, to, to that agent. But you may want other people to be able to receive information too. So while you want as we discussed before, we want one person to be the point person on making medical decisions and to be able to speak for you. You may want your full, any of your family members to receive information. So we always recommend uh, executing a, a broader document, a HIPAA release, to anyone you would want free to be able to see your medical records to talk to, to medical personnel, um, whether it's all everyone in your family or again other people that, that you want to be able to receive that information you can execute a HIPAA release permitting medical professionals and uh, institutions to, to share information with them. So that's the receiving information from the medical profession. Now there's no bar on the medical profession receiving information from anybody. However, sometimes uh, people are really busy. So if you're in an emergency room or if you're in a hospital or even your, your, your doctor or their, their staff, they may be really busy and not want to bother with talking to too many people. And sometimes they put the HIPAA up as an obstacle to them even receiving information. And, um, and that can be a problem because it could be really important information they may need to know. They may need to know about your medications. They may need to know about what exactly happened. They may need to know... Um, what your status was before whatever the incident was is put put you in an emergency room because when you present to an emergency room whatever state you're in which may uh, be groggy or incapacitated or or, or or confused they don't know that that's not your normal state that you're suffering from dementia or something like that and they may come to go to jump to assumptions which may be wrong so it's important that um that HIPAA be the, the HIPAA release be available just in case. Now, I don't think we haven't run into this issue as re, as much recently as we did when HIPAA was first passed. Um, so I think I think the medical profession um, has got it basically that it's a, it's really a one way protection, not the other way. But still, just in case you run into somebody, it's good to have that. Yeah, and from a practical perspective, it seems like some hospitals, some doctors, there's a gray zone. Some doctors will um, maybe talk to the um, next of kin, if, even if there's no HIPAA, 
Other yeah. institutions may say, we want the hip before we'll talk to you. And so from a practical perspective, people should expect a whole range of outcomes when they're dealing with this issue. That's absolutely correct. I, I think, I mean, the, the reality is, again, I think uh, institutions and medical personnel have, have loosened up a bit. Then they again, there's been a, an evolution since when it was, the, the law was first passed, when there were people were really worried about liability. And I think they're less worried today. I mean, there hasn't been, haven't been a lot of lawsuits against people for, for breaching HIPAA. Um, and so um, if it makes sense to communicate with, uh, with others, um, they do in most cases. But, um, but still, it's, uh, I think it's still good to have that as, 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 as uh, insurance in case you run into somebody who's going to stand on ceremony. And it can also help if there's issues within families where, the, say, the healthcare agent is not sharing information and is telling, um, is telling medical people not to talk to you or talk to other family members. If you want complete transparency and cooperation, then it's good to, to list on the HIPAA, release everybody you want to receive information. And um, if there's a dispute about that at some point in the future, it's pretty clear on the HIPAA release who you wanted to receive the information. So from a practical perspective, again, uh, where do I find one? How much does it cost to complete? Where should I store it? Uh, who should have access to it? So um, I believe you can probably find them and download them online. Uh, in most, um, as with the healthcare proxy and the medical directive, most state planning attorneys are going to provide these now as part of the complete um, group of estate planning documents that, that they will prepare for people. So along with a will, durable power of attorney, a health care proxy, or durable power of attorney for, for health care and a medical directive, they'll also prepare a HIPAA release so that you can basically get the whole package together. And there's, gen there's no extra cost for that. They don't really charge per document. They charge for the doing the estate plan. So we've covered a lot of ground, Harry. I think we've covered the landscape with this topic. Um, it's part of a continuing series. Uh, next up, we'll be talking about the durable power of attorney for financial matters, and we'll be going through all the terms that people may have become acquainted with, uh, springing powers, mm -hmm. and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, et cetera, et cetera. Spring, yeah, uh, it will, yeah, spring powers are really interesting because healthcare proxies are by their nature springing because they only take effect when a medical uh, a medical doctor has, has entered your medical record that you're incapacitated. Uh, most powers of attorney, however, take effect immediately on being signed, and, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why that's better. All right. Harry, thanks again for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. It's greatly appreciated. My pleasure, Bob.